It is a great privilege to be in the house of the Lord. Sister Rich, come on, sing for us, if you will. And while she's coming, uh, Brother Prescott didn't tell how long he's known me, but he was just a boy when they came out into Arkansas. And guess what? My hair was black. Uh, things have changed since then, but I'm still preaching the same gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that I know the Lord tonight, and it's our privilege to be here with Brother and Sister Prescott. The church here, we were with uh, Brother Schaefer and his family in the church there last night. We've been up preaching for Brother Stricter. He'd been 50 years, same pastor, same church, and had 50 years uh, celebration for our anniversary celebration, and we were privileged to preach all last week and Saturday to have a special service for him and his wife, and also uh, encourage the church to go on. Who knows, Lord might give them another 50, but I doubt it. Praise the Lord. But I'm glad to be waiting, watching, and longing for the day when Jesus will appear. How many knew that Jesus was coming again? I tell you, all you have to do is listen to the news or read the paper and then get out this book. And the current events are so similar. And many of them fit like a piece in a puzzle. And we're right down in the very last hours. Those perilous times that Paul wrote to Timothy about, they are upon us. But for those of us that know the Lord, the path of the just is as a shining light that shines brighter and brighter unto the more perfect day. So it's not getting darker for the Christians. It's getting lighter and lighter and lighter and brighter. My wife's with me tonight. So glad she was able to come. The Lord's really helped her and blessed her. He brought her a mighty long way. And uh, we're still going on for the Lord, having a few uh, physical problems, but uh, we're going to just keep on going because there's a reward at the end of the race for those that endure to the end. Those that fall by the wayside, those that quit, you're in trouble. But those that keep on going, amen. Sister Rich, sing for us. Well, I'm happy for the Lord tonight. I'm glad for what He means to me. Glad to see everybody. Uh, it's always a privilege to come to Martinsville, see our friends and the ones that we don't know even. We love you. And uh, uh, we just want the Lord to move. And, uh, you know, as Brother Rich was saying, it's getting darker. But for the Christians, it's getting lighter. But I tell you what, when you look at the newspaper, and, you know, before the election, I kind of listened to the news and tried to, you know, cipher out some things, and but then after it was all over, I don't even like to listen to the news because it just upsets me, and I can't do anything but pray, and I can pray without listening to the news. So I just kind of like turn it over to whoever wants to look at the paper. But because He loves me, we can face tomorrow, and He'll bring us through, and I'm so glad that He will. Amen. He's 
suffered it all because he loved me. Then they then they carry him away, placed him in a lowly grave. For surely they thought that they had seen the end of his man. Hallelujah. But on that first and glorious day, God came and rolled the stone away. He rose from the dead because he loved me. Hallelujah. Because he loved me, my Savior died. On the cross was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name. He loved me so. Now I am his. He's mine. I know he suffered it all because he loved me. He suffered it all because he loved me. Then they carried him away, placed him in a lowly grave. For surely they thought that they had seen the end of this man. But on that third and glorious day, oh, yeah. God came and rolled the stone away. Oh, yes, hallelujah. He Because he loved me, my Savior died. On the cross was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name, he loved me so. Now I am his, oh, he's yeah. mine, I know he suffered it. Put it all because he loves me. Let's give him some praise tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, yes, he suffered for us. We owed a debt we could not pay. He paid that debt. He did not owe, but it redeemed us from sin. Praise the Lord. So good to be with the folks here from Martinsville Church. And I got an opportunity to be with them, a good number of them down at uh, Brother Meekum's in our fellowship meeting. And I got to preach to them, and Brother Bill and Sister Judy missed out on that. Of course, they was busy somewhere else. But we had a wonderful time. And you know what that pastor told me? He said something about uh, these people from up at Martinsville are really getting in. And they did, Bill. They really got in and worshipped God. We had a wonderful move of God in those meetings. And you know, it's up to us the kind of services we have. It's up to us how our faith uh, is weak or strong. It's up to us. We can build our faith, building up your most holy Faith. How do we do that? 
So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Many times when I'm all alone and somebody come in, they think I was maybe lost it because when I'm reading the Bible, many times I decide to read a chapter or two just out loud. Nobody there but me and the Lord. But it builds my faith. I use more of my senses. I use my sense of hearing. And I, I love the Word of God. Now, those that are here, some of you I don't know, but a good part of you I do know. It's so good to see you here. And I want you to continue on with the Lord because it's just about over. I'm telling you, we're getting so close. If you want to turn with me tonight into the sixth chapter of the book of Judges. Last night I had planned on preaching this message at Roanoke. And when I got to church, I felt like I should preach the message there that I prepared for here tonight. And I preached last night on the greater blessing, where the Lord told Thomas, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. Oh yes, but blessed are they which have not seen, yet believe. And I told the people that Thomas got his faith by fleshly aids, like seeing and by feeling, he got in his vision. It prepared his faith and he was blessed, all right. But when my faith owes nothing to the flesh, that's the Spirit triumphing over the flesh. Oh, thank God we can reach that place in the Lord. Galatians chapter 6, if you have it in your Bibles, and if you've got a King James Bible, it'll read like mine. If you have the NIV, uh, that's the sixth chapter of Judges. If you have a NIV Bible, it won't read like mine because that NIV stands for the non-inspired version. And I preach from the King James Version, which is the inspired version of the Word of God. Judges chapter 6. Do you have it, Brother Schaefer? Well, uh, I hate to ask you to do this. Some can't stand, but those that can and are able to stand, would you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God, Judges chapter 6. Verse 1, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle in their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. In verse 11, And there came an angel of the Lord, and sat under an oak which was an Ophrah that pertaineth unto Joash the Abrazerite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, and hath delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely 
I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Let us look at verse 13. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of? I want to preach tonight on that one little word, why. Shall we pray, Father, anoint us as we minister the Word of God. Help us to do our best, Lord, for your service. Touch some heart here tonight that's not prepared to meet you. Save some soul, sanctify, fill with the power of the Holy Ghost, and encourage every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I realize tonight that the story of Gideon and the conquest of the Midianites is one most familiar to most Bible readers. For seven years the Midianites had prevailed against Israel. And for seven years they'd invaded them and destroyed their harvest, stole their livestock, took their sustenance, and left Israel in a state of impoverishment. The reason for this can be found in verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So, hear me tonight as I preach this message. My text said, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all His miracles our fathers told us of? When you read this portion of Scripture, you soon understand that Israel is in a state of poverty and oppression from the enemy, the Midianites and the Amalekites. Because of these attacks of the enemy, the Israelites, God's children, have hid themselves in caves and dens, hiding out like scared animals in the mountains. As I've already stated, they were in this condition because they had sinned and did evil in the sight of the Lord. Why are they in such poverty? Well, they had a divided allegiance. Part of them wanted to serve God. The other part of them wanted to serve Baal. But righteousness still exalteth the nation. And sin is a reproach to any people. And when we, as a so-called Christian nation in times past, start dividing our allegiance, whether it's with the Muslims, Islam, whether it's Mohammed, whether it's Buddha, whether it's humanism, whatever it might be, when we start dividing our allegiance, then we become a subject to the judgments of Almighty God. I stand right behind the Apostle Paul when he said, If we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. What he's telling us is, there is no other gospel. There is no other way. Jesus Christ plainly declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me. So now when Israel had sown their grain, as soon as it was ready to harvest, and maybe after some of it was harvested and put in storage, the enemy came in and took away the increase. The destruction was so great that the enemy had left them no sheep, no oxen, no ass, until there, there was no sustenance. It had brought them down to their wit's end. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes it takes tragedy to get people to repent. Sometimes it takes problems to get people to turn to God. Oh, that's so true. The enemy was as grasshoppers kept round about them just waiting for them to get their crops ready at the harvest and harvested. Then the enemy, the Midianites, carried it all away. But the Bible said, finally, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. 
I wonder what is it going to take for America? When are we going to wake up to the fact that it's time we cried out unto the Lord? When is the church going to wake up to the fact that our answer is not in the preacher, it's not in the church, but the answer is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And only when we cry out to the Lord can we find the solution to today's problems. Now there was one man there by the name of Gideon who was no doubt depressed. He was discouraged. No doubt he was filled with doubt. But he, was, but he was down by the wine press, for somehow he had sowed and managed to raise a little wheat. And he was hiding at the wine press, where they usually squeeze the juice out of the grapes. But he was down there threshing wheat, hiding it from the enemy, trying to provide for his family, knowing that any moment the enemy may sweep in and take what he worked for away. His opinion of himself, I'm going to be preaching to you here in a little bit, but his opinion of himself was this. My family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. I'm here like a scared animal trying to thresh out this little wheat. And all of a sudden, he had a heavenly visitor. An angel appeared and sat down under an oak at Ophir. And all of a sudden, the angel made an announcement to him. And he said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. I can see Gideon turn around and see that angel sitting there and say, Did you say the Lord is with me? Did you say the Lord is with me? Angel, you must be a stranger around here. Maybe you don't know what's going on around here. Maybe you don't know what's taking place here. My father's house is poor. And I'm the least in my father's house. Angel, can't you see? With a cowardly heart and spirit, I'm here by this wine press, hiding from the Midianites, trying to thresh out a little wheat for my family. No, angel, you must not understand. For look with me, angel, out across those hills. They used to be white, covered with sheep. Flocks used to be out there. Herds used to be out there. But now they're empty and barren. We used to have sheep and oxen and asses and camels and all kinds of livestock. But the enemy has taken it away. And now you're telling me, angel... That the Lord is with us? You're telling me that the Lord is here? Angel, look across those barren fields that used to wave with golden grain. And now they're empty. Nothing but dust out there. Nothing out there to provide sustenance for us. Now don't blame Gideon for his doubts. For there seems to be plenty of evidence that God was not working there anymore. And yet the angel said, The Lord is with thee. The preachers tell us, in many places we go, and all of us older preachers can certainly remember when it seemed that we had better days than we have now. Oh yes, we reached more souls. The church held more interest to the public. There was more demonstrations of the Spirit and the power of God. And as an evangelist, I do win a few souls here and there. And many times I get a desire to go back to see how they're doing. And when I get back to the church where I won those souls, I find that the enemy has come in and carried the sustenance, the gain away. Taken what I'd worked for and others and pastors had worked for, taken it away. So it's easy to get doubts in your mind. When the preachers tell us the Lord's with us, then I see pastors struggling under the load. It seems about the time they're going to get the program of God going and put it over. Here comes the Midianites again, sweeping away that which we've worked for. Are you telling me, angel, 
that the Lord is with us, then I want to ask a question. Why is all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles that our fathers told us of? Are you telling me that the Lord is with us right here in 2009 where we've got preachers falling, scandals all around us, compromise everywhere we look, where we're losing the power of God, not many sick are being healed. Oh yes, people are falling out with one another and fuss is even in the holiness church that's dividing us and splitting us up and causing us to lose power with God. Well, if the Lord is with us, would somebody please tell me, why has all this befallen us? Where be all those miracles? Oh, you never get too big to ask why. Anybody besides me ever ask why? Why is all this happening? Why are we having the tragedies that were happening, that's happening now? Why is our nation, who one time reverenced God Almighty, oh, as losing the reverence of the holy name of Jesus? Some places they don't mind for you praying to God, because God could be whoever you might feel that He is in your mind. But when you attach Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, to that statement, it roused the world up. Oh, yes. Why is there so much hatred? Why is there so much dissatisfaction with the name of Jesus? Why is our young people turning from the things they know and learned as children in the house of the Lord to the things of the world? You don't have to get out that, uh, uh, what's that magazine that's got all the countries in it, the National Geographic, to see what's going on in pagan countries. All you've got to do is walk down on our streets and look around and you can see that a so-called Christian America is quickly becoming pagan. Oh, endowed with so many things. We see all kinds of people with all kinds of things around them and a lot of stuff that's not on them and should be on them. And we see all of this body piercing and all this uh, tattoos. Hold on now. Oh, yes, and all of this stuff that's pagan. When we see men encouraging them to worship some other god besides the god of their fathers, we see a weakening of the power of the Holy Ghost even in the holiness church. I went into a so-called holiness church just long ago, and I was amazed and shocked at the way that some of the people were dressed. Some of the good Christian ladies that in times gone by now wearing low-cut dresses, splits up the side, dresses too tight and too short. Now, don't quit me now. I'm, I'm a holiness preacher, so I'm preaching why. Oh, yeah, we wonder why we're not having the move of God. And I walked in there and I thought, why are these women, women wanting to show half of their bosom that is supposed to be Christian? I'm under the rule of the pastor. If he wants me to sit down, I'll sit down. But I'm going to preach it as long as he leaves me up here. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Yes. I'll tell you what happened in Gideon's day. His own father had it built, planted a grove, and he had a God erected to Baal. There was a divided allegiance, even in Gideon's household. Sometimes in our own houses, there is a divided allegiance between husband and wife, between a family, mothers and fathers and children. Oh, yes, it's happening all around us. Yes, sir. But God, God, the angel said, God is with you. Well, why did the angel say to Gideon, Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. Well, I looked that up yesterday, and that word valor means you are a man of courage. A man of heroism. A man that's strong, strong, strong. Oh, yes, and the angel said to Gideon, Thy mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. And can't you see Gideon giving his excuses, saying, I, I don't know why you told me this, angel. The Midianites are out there just waiting to sweep in on us and take what I've labored for. 
And the angel said to Gideon, I want to tell you something to Gideon. Most of Israel has lost heart. And they don't sow anymore. And your comrades say, what's the use of sowing wheat if the enemy is going to come in and carry it away? Your comrades are saying, what's the use of keeping on raising little lambs and taking care of different things of the livestock? When about the time we get the lambs ready for slaughter, in comes the enemy and takes it all away. But listen to me, even though the harvest was small, even though Gideon didn't have much to thresh, he did not let his losses interfere with his duty. He knew it was his duty to continue to sow. He knew it was his duty if he raised a little bit of grain to thresh out that grain and try to prepare it for his family. He knew even though those little lambs may never get to the, the market for him, the Midianites might take them away. It was his duty to keep working with those lambs and try to make some provision for his family. And so now I'm ready to preach to you. Who are the heroes of our day? It is not those that quit. It's not those that shirk their duty. It is not those that turn their back on what God's called them to do. The heroes of our day says, I know it's right to preach the gospel. I know it's my duty to keep on sowing. I know it's my duty to keep on telling the good news that Jesus saves. I know it's my duty, amen, to preach and attend the house of God. And if you're not a preacher, it's your duty and your responsibility to keep the house of God going and to be here with your presence and to be in the house of the Lord. That's our duty and responsibility. And when we let the enemy take us that desire away from us to see the kingdom of God feathered, we're going to lose the battle. Gideon, he was a mighty man of valor. He tried to make excuses. But the Lord told him to go in this thy might. What might? The might that he was not sufficient within himself. He's going to have to have the Lord to do the work for him. Hear me, church. We've got to keep on having church. We've got to keep on having spiritual services. We've got to keep on preaching the gospel to the lost. We've got to tell men and women, boys and girls, that the only hope for this nation and the only hope for this generation is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Oh yes, I'm getting old and I'm getting tired, but I've got a duty and a responsibility to preach the gospel. As long as there's breath in my body, I'm going to tell the story, Jesus is the answer. Hallelujah. Oh, Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. Brother Prescott, keep on sowing. Brother Schaefer, keep on sowing. Other preachers and pastors, keep on sowing the seed. Sow your seed in the morning. And then in the evening, sow it again. Oh, he that observeth the wind will not sow. Oh, then he that regardeth the clouds will not reap. Hear me, I need a harvest so bad that I cannot afford to observe the wind. Oh, I cannot wait till there's no clouds in the sky to sow. I cannot wait till there's nothing out there that would hinder. I cannot wait for a perfect atmosphere. I'm needing a harvest so bad, I've got to keep on sowing. If the wind's blowing, I'm going to sow anyhow. If the clouds are rolling, I'm still going to sow because that's my duty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not going to wait till everything's just right in the church before I praise the Lord. I'm not going to wait till everybody's just what I want them to be. Because if I wait till then, I'll never praise Him. Hallelujah. Oh, but listen to me. Listen to me. God spoke to Gideon and said, All right, Gideon, here's what's wrong. There's problems in your family. There's problems in Israel. They've de divided their allegiance. But you get your own household cleaned up. Get rid of those things that are displeasing to God. Get rid of that, and I'll be show you that I'm with you. 
Oh, I'm still here to get in, but there's some adjustments you've got to make. There's some things that's got to be done before you see my power in operation again. And so Gideon rises up in the night, and he gets two big old bullets. That's big old oxen. You know what they are? Great big old oxen. He takes them out. He cuts down the grove in the night that his father had grown for idol worship. Then he takes those bullocks and he pulls down the altar. Man, I'd have liked to have been there. I'd have hollered hallelujah when that altar came down. Oh, yes, he pulled down that altar and he offered a bullet on that uh, as he built another altar to the Lord, he offered the other bullock on that altar. When the sun come up the next morning, the men rose up. The grove is gone. Oh, yes, their old altar's gone. Baal's not around. His altar's not there anymore. They cried out to the Father, said, We know who's done this. Gideon's done this. And they wanted Gideon to be stoned and killed. But his father, Gideon's father's pretty smart. Said, if Baal is a god, let him plead for himself. Why are you pleading for him? Let him plead for himself. Oh, yes, they got that all tore down. And God said, all right, Gideon, since you've got all of this taken care of, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to become incorporated with you. We're going to make a corporation. And I'm going to send you out to the battle. And you're going to defeat the Midianites as one man. And when you go out there, don't forget we're making an incorporation. And don't you say the sword of Gideon. Don't forget I'm incorporated with you. Say it's the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Hey, 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 we can win the battle if we'll take the Lord in our lives and get rid of the things that's displeasing. I'm finding now people hard to get along with. My own son told me, said, Dad, you could not pastor in this day and time. I said, what do you mean, son? I was pastoring. I'm not going to tell you what I told him. I said, I was pastoring. Oh, you're born, man. You're telling me I couldn't pastor? He said, no. I said, why? He said, you're too stringent. You're too hard. He said, you can never pastor. Well, listen. My Bible still reads the same way it did back 50 years ago when I started preaching. But Leon said, I couldn't do it. He may be right. But he said, people won't stay. You start preaching them the truth and tighten the lid down on them tight. And they're going to go hunt them some other place to go. They might do it, but when you leave the truth, you're going to leave your soul behind. Oh, yes, you've got to stay where the truth's at. Hallelujah. Well, Gideon, he rose up and he blew a trumpet. How many men answered the call? 30,000. 30,000 soldiers showed up. So we're ready to go fight. And God said, there's too many. He said, tell everybody that's afraid and a coward to go back home. 20,000 of them. Yellow spined, spineless men would not go out and fight. Well, we've got a lot of people that won't stand up for the right, won't stand up for the truth. But folks, we've got to have a church that's strong enough to stand up against evil. No matter what others say or think, we've got to stand up for the right, stand up for the truth. We've got a generation coming on that's got to know that only the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Not some kind of fairy tale. When I was pastor, I took the Sunday school teacher out of her office because she was uh, come by our Sunday school class two or three Sunday mornings. She was reading Goldilocks and uh, uh, Peter Pig or whatever it was, reading books like that to her Sunday school class. Now I grabbed that door on about the third time I come by there. I said, hey, we're not bringing these children in here to tell them about Goldilocks and the Golden Slipper. We're bringing them in here to tell them about Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. They're only here 30, 45 minutes. That's why Leon said I wouldn't be able to pastor. Maybe not. But I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. We're raising a generation that do not know their God. 
Oh, yes, there arose another generation that knew not the Lord. They knew the commandments. They had their form of worship. Oh, yes, they had their altars. They had all of this, but they did not know the God of heaven. We cannot just have the symbol. We've got to have the substance. Oh, hallelujah. Boy, I'm feeling like preaching now. I said, we cannot just have the symbol. When they brought that Ark of the Covenant back into the camp after Israel had sinned and went against God, oh, Israel cried out until the earth rang out. And they had the Ark of the Covenant, which was a symbol of God's presence. They had the Ark, but they did not have the God of the Ark. And we've got the church, we've got the beautiful pews, we've got the beautiful organs and the pianos and instruments, but we've got to have God. Oh, more than anything else, we've got to have the presence of God in our churches. Oh, I love good shouting services. Man, your people caught down there. Uh, Brother Meekham, man, they was having themselves a time and so was I. I love those good kind of services. But it's more than just emotion, my friend. We've got to have the God that makes us happy. Praise the Lord. Well, maybe I better move on just a little bit farther. He has 20,000 now. Goes back. That left him with 10,000. And God said, there's still too many. You take them down to the water. And I'll try them there. I used to think that said, take them down to the water and try them there. No, God said, I'll try them there. You take them down to the water and I'll try them there. said, everyone that lappeth water like a dog, they'll go with you in your army. Send the rest of them back home. Boys, you know why? If they'd have been down there and laying down, the enemy could have come in. But whether they was on the alert. Now, God says, when you go out there, get in, get, ever, get you some lamps. And put a lamp in every man's hand. And put a light in those lamps. What good is a lamp without the light? What good is a scabbard without the sword? Are you listening to what I'm telling you? Boy, you've got a beautiful church. You have told folks about it. But what good is the church if we don't have the presence and the power of God moving? I'm not saying you don't have. They've told me about the good services you've been having. But we've got to have more of God. Oh, He's got to be lifted up. Did not Jesus say, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to have a Holy Ghost filled church. Listen now, this, when those went down to the water hole, only 300 of them lapped up water like a dog. But Gideon took those 300 men who had lamps in their hands, positioned them all around the camp of the Midianites. And he said, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, whew, break the lamp. Let the light shine out. Hey, I think it's time somebody broke the lamps. Don't you? Let the light shine out. Break it. And all of a sudden, Amalekites looked and they saw them lights shining all around them. You know what they did? They turned on one another. Oh, yes. And they fled like cowards and they were cowards. Oh, yes. And Gideon won that battle. Hear what I'm telling you tonight? We've got a battle to fight. And the Lord's still with us. And you say, well, Brother Rich, I haven't felt the Lord in a long time. He's standing by, waiting on you to make some adjustments in your life. Put away the things that's displeasing to God. Oh, yes, get rid of those things that you used to wouldn't do that you do now. Hallelujah. Get rid of those evil thoughts. Uh, get rid of, rid of the bad feelings you have against your brothers and sisters. Hey, 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 the Lord's standing by, just waiting to work, waiting to save, waiting to sanctify, waiting to fill with the Holy Ghost. Yes, the Lord is with you. One scripture says, the Lord is with you while you be with Him. 
But if you forsake Him, He will forsake you. That's easy to understand, isn't it? I've got to stick with Him. Well, I'm still sowing. Right here, all knocking on year number 75's door. I've been sowing about 50 years, Brother Bill. The Bible said, Blessed is he that soweth by all waters. Oh, yes. Say, well, where I'm at, it's not very fertile. Not going to be a pr- pretty much of a waste of seed to sow. Go ahead and sow. You never know when one grain of, oh, might get on good ground. The sower went forth to sow. Oh, yes, the first time he sowed, the, the Bible said that the seed fell among stones. Stony ground. And then, another place, the thorns. He sowed among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked the Word, and choked the seed, and so forth. But then, he got a seed on good ground. And it brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. Oh, I was telling him last night, years ago, in California, just a young man, I went to church. And I heard an old-fashioned preacher preaching. Preaching on the wages of sin is death. He didn't cut you no slack. It wasn't easy on you like we are now, like I'm preaching now. I mean, boy, when they preached to you, they laid your life out. Made you think that somehow they got some information from somebody who knew you real well and told them what you've been doing. I mean, they just lay your life out. And that man was getting close to me. And I thought, Lord, have mercy. I better get out of here. I don't like this. I better get away. But after a while, he turned the table and said, even though the wages of sin is death, God has a gift for you. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, I responded to that, Brother Peach. I went to that altar that night. I didn't just pray till I knew I was saved. Those people prayed with me till they knew I was saved. I mean, that's the kind of what kind of church I was in. Oh, they knew I was saved. Amen. They had a witness that I'd been saved. I'm wondering tonight how many believes the Lord's still with us. How many believes He's waiting for us to make some adjustments? Then He will manifest Himself. You know, manifestation is what we've got to have, Brother Prescott. You see, God was in that Philippian jail before Paul and Silas ever got thrown into that jail. But when they got in that jailhouse and got to singing praises and praying at midnight, God said, it's time to manifest Myself in this place. And they would open. Prison doors swing open. The very foundations begin to shake. Oh yeah, jailhouse doors swung open. They had a mighty revival there at midnight in that place. And hear me tonight. What the holiness church needs is another manifestation of the Spirit of God. I remember when I was here in revival. When was that? When we dedicated this building? About a year ago. Wow, you had a manifestation one night. God filled you with the Holy Ghost. This girl here has got in here and sought the Lord so, and then right at home or somewhere there, she had a manifestation of the Spirit. God's willing to manifest Himself, make Himself real. I don't know about you, but when I, Sister Rich mentioned she quit listening to the news, I still get the paper and read it sometimes. There are many discouraging things in there. When you read about such terrible people that we have elected into those public offices, what was wrong with America when they put those people in office? Hey, what was wrong with us? I don't know. I don't don't know politician get upset at me. But I'm telling you, we've got a regime that does not appreciate our salvation. They do not appreciate being like me. And I was telling Brother uh, Schaefer coming down here, I said, we're reaching the place where men like me who preach against such terrible things as homosexuality 
preach against such terrible things as all of this global uh, Planned Parenthood that they're wanting America to pay for. All of these things that are so sinful. When we preach against it, they're going to deem some of us old timers as crazy. I mean, you ever heard of euthanasia? That's where they take people that they don't think should be allowed to live, won't be profitable no more to our economy, put them out of our misery. What they're going to do is send me on home a little early. Hallelujah. I'm heaven bound. Praise the Lord. But that's coming. I'm afraid it's coming. Oh, yes. Those that might have children that are handicapped, born, and the, uh, uh, the uh, what they call this scan they put on expectant mothers, uh, sonogram, shows that the baby could be born handicapped. They're going to force you to abort that child. You're going to see a big change coming if the Lord lets this old world stand. That's why I'm here sowing tonight. Oh, that's why I'm here telling you, get a good firm hold on Jesus Christ. I'm just about finished. I'm sorry I did what I'm famous for, left my notes completely behind. Hallelujah. But listen to me. We must have Jesus Christ in our lives. But the most important thing is to know you're ready to meet Jesus. Hallelujah. To know that your name is in the book of life. It's so strange how we, we put other things that they seem more important to us than our own soul, which is more valuable than the wealth of the world. But oh, Jesus loves you. He'll take you like you are. He took the prodigal son just like he was when he came back. But he loved him so much, he would not leave him that way. He said, go get the best robe. Bring some shoes for his feet. Ring for his hand. Oh, yes, my son was dead, but he's alive again. Stand with me, please, if you will.